I can do this one. Okay. So if I'm in low power, we can see this really deep punch valve. So you can see something really thick and yeah. down there. So and, for this. Okay. Yeah. And then really sclerotic, thick and. Yeah, very so sclerotic. Yeah. And then tons of information mixed between outside lymphocytes, most likely. Yeah, hard to tell on this scan, but lymphocytes, a lot of times you'll see plasma cells in here, and you may or may not see these little guys, eosinophils, right? Yes. yes. So what is it then, Li Ping? Eosinophilic fasciitis. Yeah, this is a nice, really nice example of eosinophilic fasciitis, which is something I only rarely see in practice. So this presents as a firm, uh, woody in duration, that's the term that's often used to describe it, like a firm plaque that's very hard and feels like fixed. If you try to move it, like it kind of all moves together, right? Because it's fixed to the fascia is the idea. And it's on oftentimes like on the thigh, on the leg, and it may be bilateral sometimes. And it, uh, I, my understanding is that some cases can be painful. Is that right? Do you guys, do you guys think of it as painful sometimes? I think it can be painful. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I feel like, I don't know how often, but I feel like, I, I feel like I've read sometimes it can. Again, I've only seen a, a few pretty convincing cases, and this is probably the best example I've seen, honestly. I thought I had a really good recut of it, but this is even better. So the derma, the epidermis, dermis, and, e and even the upper part of the subcutaneous is pretty normal. Then as we get down, you start seeing some thickening and sclerosis of the subcutaneous septa, right? The lobules may have a little touch of necrosis and some inflammation, but really not too bothered. The septa are getting thickened, and then here it's really thickened and very like layered sclerosis here, going all the way down from this deep uh, sub Q and kind of hooking up on, this is the normal fascia right here, see? The squiggly line, the, the ramen noodle sign, zig, you know, real squiggly like the instant noodles out of a package um, that uh, my fellow Ed Fulton liked to say is a good sign for dense regular connective tissue or for fibroblastic things. So that is, that's fascia there. And so this sclerotic bands coming from the subcutis are kind of attaching and adhering to and even sometimes full thickness involvement of the fascia. So we want sclerosis of the subcutaneous septa and or fascia. And ideally we'll get some lymphocyte aggregates often with plasma cells. And the idea that many people have and that, that I think is probably true is that this is basically uh, like a form of deep morphia, right? So morphia is localized scleroderma, scleroderma that makes kind of a linear or plaque-like area, usually causes dense sclerosis of the dermis with lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate often around the deep dermal vessels. So if you take that same kind of pattern of what you see in morphia and take it from the dermis and move it down to the subcutaneous septa and or the fascia, that's basically what you get in eosinophilic fasciitis. Now, why is it called eosinophilic fasciitis? Well, you would expect there to be eosinophils, and sometimes there are, but there it don't have to be, okay? So eos may be present, sometimes even abundant, but there are many cases that, that have, have no eos at all, okay? So if you want, you can think, well, the collagen looks eosinophilic, if that helps you to remember it. I, I don't think that's why it's named that way. So I think that some of the earlier cases that were recognized had eos, but we now see cases that, that don't uh, have eos. So I've seen a, a couple of the cases I saw actually had v almost no eos. So don't expect eos to be there despite the name. It's a bit of a misnomer, okay? You may get a little fibrin in here. You may get more inflammation in some cases. Some cases, uh, uh, one case... I saw had less inflammation than this, just like morphia, right? It can have more inflammation early on. Later on, it kind of burns out and it's just sclerotic collagen with, with less inflammation. So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, kind of disease because it has a unique presentation and a pretty unique appearance. The important thing is obviously you got to get the right biopsy to make this diagnosis. If you just have a shave, no way. Of course, anything we're talking about here, shave biopsy, not acceptable. Even a regular, all, all the things today, paniculitis, I guess I should have talked about that at first. The best scenario is to get a biopsy like this, an ellipse, a wedge, an incisional biopsy. Uh, ideally, if you can go from normal skin into the abnormal skin, and then when it gets sectioned, uh, if you can do it longitudinally so you can see the interface from normal to abnormal, that can be really helpful in a variety of settings, particularly in paniculitis or big ulcers when you're thinking of calciphylaxis and limes. Uh, PG, pyoderma gangrenosum, those kind of things having this big, deep biopsy of a large piece of tissue. 
I understand that's not always easy to do, especially uh, if the patient's inpatient on the floor. So a very deep punch or a telescoping, aka double punch, where you punch down as deep as you can go in the fat, snip that piece out, and then go into the same hole and punch out more fat is not perfect. It sometimes works well. Sometimes it gets kind of fragmented and it doesn't work. But I've often seen double punches get the job done. So if, you, if you're able to get an ellipse or a wedge, that's the best, especially for eosinophilic fasciitis. For other forms of paniculitis, I feel a double punch often is good enough to get the job done. But this is a disease that can be really hard to diagnose. Because what if you just get like that? Uh, there's a little sclerosis in the subcutis, but can I make a diagnosis for sure just on this one area with one vessel with perivascular limbs? And this would have been a really deep biopsy already. So this is one where you really, you might even want general surgery if you're not comfortable to go down and get you a wedge to the fascia, ideally take a little fascia with it if they can. Okay. So it, it, this is not a diagnosis that's seen or entertained very often. I mean, I only see this come up on the differential diagnosis for patients, maybe a couple times a year. Okay. So uh, it's an important disease to know about, but it is rare. Okay. And, uh, and you got to get the right biopsy. You got to get deep enough. If you're not down near the fascia, you're probably going to miss the diagnostic features. And I'm going to tell you that you need to go back and sample deeper again. So go ahead and take the time to get that, that biopsy done the right way the first time so we can get this diagnosis. I do not know much about treatment or management of this disease, but but in any case, it is a, it's a pretty interesting thing that you don't get to see a good example really often. And the last thing I'll point out before we move on is I did see a case um, in the past of scurvy that presented clinically as ESN, they were really worried it's eosinophilic fasciitis. The, the patient was um, an adolescent and had a very restricted diet, had, a, had dietary um, uh, issues, and they were only taking in a very limited diet. And they had scurvy, but no one suspected scurvy because they had basically no hemorrhages on the skin. Uh, but a very astute resident took uh, clinical photos that even though they weren't exciting looking, there were some abnormalities of the hairs. The hairs looked kind of corkscrew. The patient had firm indurated plaques on imaging. They had kind of some enhancing signal and thickening of the fascia. So the idea of eosinophilic fasciitis came up because it was really painful. And that it was so much pain that the person like really was struggling to walk. And, uh, and only because of the corkscrew hairs and then the good history about that the patient had limited dietary intake, and then some good searching by another uh, brilliant colleague who was able to find out that in fact, there have been a few cases of scurvy reported as presenting like eosinophilic fasciitis, but microscopically, all I saw was a little bit of, of kind of maybe some sclerosis, not much, and some hemorrhage, very nonspecific stuff, a little touch of fat necrosis. It just looked like nothing microscopically. It did not really look like this uh, at all, but it clinically was presenting like this, and, and only with all the pieces put together uh, did it come out to be uh, that it was actually scurvy. So that was pretty awesome. 